Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of Roosevelt House on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb. It's a pleasure to welcome you tonight to yet another in our series of virtual public programs from Roosevelt House, which have attracted, I'm proud and kind of astonished to note, 15,000 people since the pandemic lockdown began a year ago. We're awfully grateful to those of you who have tuned in over these last 12 months. And uh, we urge you to keep listening in. We have extraordinary programs and we will meet again in person some at some point. Meanwhile, we're reaching so many of you virtually and we're really glad. Um, as we continue living through a period of historic and sometimes unsettling changes for our country and our city, it's really fitting that we gather under Roosevelt House auspices to discuss the evolution, or as you'll hear tonight, the various evolutions of our city over the previous four decades. And the reason I say it's appropriate uh, is because Roosevelt House was the spot where the various programs of the New Deal had their foundational and organizational beginnings right in our second floor library. Well, to guide us to a new and much needed re-examination of the last four decades, we are very pleased to welcome tonight the author Thomas Dija to discuss his brand new book published just last week and already featured on the cover of this past Sunday's New York Times book review. And the book is New York, New York, New York, Four Decades of Success, Excess, and Transformation. When I first saw the title, I admit to thinking maybe New York was when mentioned uh, one, at least once too often. It's like Liza Minnelli plus one, until I realized that the title and the epigraph allude to the words of a former Hunter professor of urban sociology, the renowned observer of New York City street life, William Holly White, who when asked once to name his three favorite American cities, famously said, New York, New York, New York. So we're excited that there is a hunter antecedent to Mr. Dyja's explorations. We are, of course, at Roosevelt House, equally emphatic about our fondness for and our interest in the city we have long called home. And of course, Roosevelt House has long served as one of the city's central hubs for civic discourse on the history, policy, and personalities that have most powerfully impacted on the lives of all New Yorkers. We're expanding on that conversation tonight with a writer who has now established himself among the country's foremost urban chroniclers. Tom's previous books include Walter White, The Dilemma of Black Identity in America, only Connect, The Way to Save Our Schools, which he wrote with former New York City Schools Chancellor Rudy Crew. Three novels, among them um, a Civil War story, Play for a Kingdom, and most recently the award-winning book The Third Coast, When Chicago Built the American Dream. We can forgive him for his exploration of that city. Among the applause and honors that the Third Coast received were recognition as a one book, one Chicago selection and the 2013 Heartland Prize for nonfiction. With New York Three, uh, Mr. Dija trains his keen eye and powerful prose on the city where he lives, having already tackled in such outstanding fashion uh, the one from which he hails in a writing style that really pulsate, pulsates with New York style energy. He provides a sweeping and immersive history of one of our most transformative eras from near bankruptcy in the 70s through fiscal stabilization under Mayor Koch, lowering crime and, and growing tensions under Mayor Rudy Giuliani and renewed wealth and a different vision under Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Recounting both successes and failures, the upswings and the downfalls, Tom helps to illuminate the lessons that most powerfully point the way forward. And as I mentioned, critics uh, 
including Kevin Baker in the New York Times, are already giving New York, New York, New York a place alongside other giants of the genre, such as E.B. White's Here is New York and The Power Broker, whose great author, Robert Caro, we were so fortunate to host at Roosevelt House around this very time a couple of years ago. To speak with Mr. Dija, I am particularly pleased to welcome our good friend, Professor Joe Vitteridi, the Thomas Hunter Professor of Public Policy at Hunter and the founding faculty chair of the public policy program right here at Roosevelt House, who we hosted most recently, just before the pandemic began for a memorable conversation about the Bloomberg years with Bloomberg biographer, Eleanor Randolph. Before coming to Hunter, Joe taught at Princeton, NYU, Harvard, and SUNY at Albany. In addition to his invaluable perspective and teaching as a Hunter College professor, Joe is an esteemed New York historian, widely regarded as an expert on the political, economic, and social development of the city, frequently quoted in the New York press, published widely in social science journals and law reviews, and everything that covers city politics, education policy, criminal justice, and urban law. His recent deeply informed, insightful, and at some moments even reassuring articles on the COVID-19 crisis and the leadership that will be needed from the city's next mayor in order to persevere have appeared in City Limits and Gotham Gazette. And Joe should know about leadership. He's the author of two definitive mayoral biographies, The Pragmatist, Bill de Blasio's quest to save the soul of New York, and Summer in the City, John Lindsay, New York, and the American Dream, which takes a clear-eyed look at John Lindsay's tenure during the tumultuous 60s. So as we begin tonight, I urge you to click the link in the chat room on your screens to purchase a copy of New York, New York, New York, uh, autograph book plates available from Shakespeare and Company, our Roosevelt House official book dealer. And don't forget, ask your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, in about 45 minutes, our program curator, Mac Barrett, will be on screen as usual to lead the Q&A with our two guests. With that, please welcome Thomas Dija in conversation with Joe Vitteridi. Tom, uh, let me join uh, my colleague Harold in welcoming you to Roosevelt House and Hunter College and for the extraordinary review you got on the front page of the New York Times last Sunday. Uh, talk about a book launch. It doesn't get much better than that. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pretty magical weekend for me, so thank you. Um, before we get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about you and your writing. Mm -hmm. um, as um, you started as a, as a fiction writer. You wrote three novels. Uh, then you moved to a biography of Walter White, the, uh, the leader of the NAACP during a very important period of history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moved on to Chicago, uh, wrote a book on Chicago, your native yeah, city. Yeah, right. and now here you are in New York, New York, New York, or we'll call it New York Times Three. I think, I think it's easier okay yeah. now. What is it like to move from one genre of writing to another? What, um, what would motivate somebody to do that? And, right. and what, what's, what's it like? Is there a difference between one kind of writing and another? Well, you know, all the fiction that I've written has been based, historically based in some way. The, the first novel was about a series of baseball games between the North and South during the Civil War. The second one was about a it was the more contemporary novel about a man who becomes a Civil War reenactor and kind of a ghost story. And the third was based loosely on the life of Walter White, who I wrote later wrote the biography of. So all three of those involved a lot of research. They involved creating the kinds of historical timelines that I used in history. But you know, it was fiction. It was creating plot. It was creating character. It was creating event and sense of scene and dialogue and all that sort of thing. And as I moved into nonfiction, I really was able to bring 
some of those fictional tools with me, knowing very well the responsibility and the task is different, but still having a, a sense that you need to move people along, that you need to create moment, you need to create, um, you know, write character or write historically about people with the same sort of color and excitement and interest that you'd bring writing fiction, that you just assume to be a part of writing fiction. So, you know, reading historians, Lytton Strakey, learning how to do quick, you know, takes of people um, was as much a fictional thing as it was a, um, you know, kind of historical writing mindset. And certainly the sense of, of research and creating timelines, as I mentioned, was something I was already doing for my fiction. So doing it for, for serious history, nonfiction, just, it was just transitioning into that really. How long ago was it when you jumped into this project and what, what motivated it? It was, it was eight years ago um, and I live on the Upper West Side and there was, a, you know, so the, the, the Bloomberg years were coming to an end um, and we had the, you know, election going on. Didn't know yet that it was gonna be de Blasio, but in my neighborhood, there was an old burger place called Big Nick's, um, which was, you know, not, not a place you went to very often, but you wanted it to be there. It was just a burger place. Tourists came, the kids would go after Little League, the, the you know, the Arab guys at the newsstand next door. It's just a neighborhood place and it got, it was closed. And it just seemed of a moment that the city was going to be making a big change here. The Bloomberg years were going to be over. We were probably going forward into some more progressive period here. So it seemed like we had a bookend period now from, from the fiscal crisis in Koch through Bloomberg. And along with that was coming a, a, a discussion about the city that I was finding kind of frightening, because, not frightening, but frustrating because it wasn't really a discussion. It was, these things were good, these things were bad this very binary take on what had happened over those 40 years, um, which was not feeling very fruitful. Um, so I, I wanted to take a dive in and look at things like gentrification and broken windows and all these things that had become kinds of terms of art that we didn't really know, we kind of know how they make us feel, but not necessarily how they started or how they were used over these 40 years. I wanted to dive back in and see who were the people, who were the events, what were the uh, uh, policies that really created this change in New York over those years, and certainly in a neighborhood, you know, Upper West Side, very different place when I started this book in 2013 than it was when I moved here in, in 1980. Um, and so how did that happen? What were the ideas behind it, not just in a kind of headline bumper sticker level, but on a life lived level and finding the people? And that was exciting to me. That was the real goal of the book. What's different about writing about New York versus Chicago? Well, one of the basic things is the Chicago book takes place um, in a kind of short span, post-war era from 45 to 60, really, with some dips before. So that was writing about people who, for the most part, had passed. You know, it was that was an era that was much more historical. This was a period when I was writing through things that I had lived through. So there was a slightly greater sense of responsibility for me to not make assumptions. I mean, in both books, I started feeling like I knew a knot because I lived through some of this, but I, I made it very much, uh, you know, I started saying, forget everything you know, um, start your research from scratch. And I did that in, in both places, um, but keeping a kind of emotive resonance, I think. I was kind of checking my emotional facts as I went. So, it was important for me to, when I thought things happened or what I thought had happened, to make sure that I could actually see whether that was what had really happened. And um, having to people who were very much players in the events was different. I was able to interview a lot of the people who actually helped make that change versus the Chicago book where most of the people, um, frankly, were, you know, Nelson Algren had long died. There's a lot of people who had long, Mayor Daly had long die. There was no chance to talk to those people. And that was a much more straight research project. So who do you talk to starting out? Who are your, who are your sources? Well, I will tell you, the, first, the person who was, I think, the greatest help in launching me forward was Harvey Robbins, who had been director of operations for Dinkins and, you know, worked under Koch and who um, just sat with me for hours and hours and hours going through stuff. You know, I beat him up with questions about things. And like I said, I was really coming to this without 
a big policy background. You know, um, I really was coming at it with, um, you know, just naively coming to it in a certain way. And so Harvey was a wonderful first start who pointed me towards the mayor's, you know, annual report and uh, the municipal, that great series setting municipal priorities. Uh, he just, he gave me the kind of foundational who to go to. Um, I had a great researcher who dove into the, uh, the, uh, the Furman Library. So I had piles, like I had all the housing and vacancy surveys and sort of had that base of, of data. But Harvey gave me, a, I would say, a philosophical basis in that he was very realistic about the realities of, of wealth in the city, that there's always going to be rich people. There are things that are always going to happen. There's always going to be power. But why can't we ever, you know, let's make sure we take care of people. You know, how do we, how do we take care of people in the city? It also reminds me of this wonderful quote I came across on a, by uh, Senator Wagner, who was Mayor Wagner's father, I think, right? right. Um, and he had done very well. He had grown up in Yorkville and had made a lot of money. And someone asked him about his, his wealth. And he said, luck, luck, luck. Think about the others. You know, and, and to me, that summed up a, a kind of approach to New York that we, we lost over these years, which was everyone wants to make it in New York. You know, Sinatra's not wrong. Jay-Z's not wrong. It's the empire city. And we don't begrudge people big nights out and you know, cufflinks and, and wealth to a certain degree. But there used to be room for everyone in there. And there was a sense of, of saying, yes, I, I was lucky, I hit it rich, now let's take care of some other people. And that's one of the things that I think slid away from us over these 40 years. And so somebody like Harvey was a great corrective to start with, not a corrective, but a great base level of seeing the city in very practical and realistic terms that had space for everyone in it. Yeah. So this, this, is a, this is a book really about what I would consider post-fiscal crisis New York. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I view New York history through mayoral administrations. So to me, this is a book about Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, Bloomberg for the most part. You mentioned uh, you mentioned de Blasio at the end, but you're not really, you don't really do much with that. Um, and, um, and to use your terminology, terminology, it's, it's a book about Renaissance reform and, and reimagination. Um, to explain those terms. What, what, what do you mean by them? What, where right. do they connect to these? I mean, I think the, the reason why I didn't just do straight mayors is that it is more than just a policy book. I mean, I the mayoral policy is there, but for me, the, the cultural issues, the societal issues, technology, there's a whole lot of things that are outside the purview of City Hall that have weave into and are as causal as anything that happens, you know, in the blue room or in the, you know, the old- I, I want to get to them, but I, I'd like you to- I mean, so, But I mean, so that's why I kind of broke it into those pieces. Yeah, that that is not, um, so, to me, the, the, the Renaissance was directly the, the kind of Koch post-fiscal crisis era of taking, trying to pull the city up um, through retrenchment to that kind of Renaissance that happens through Wall Street exploding again. Um, and, it, and it really peaks with the Black Monday, the, the uh, Wall Street bust, and then kind of dips down into back again through the Dinkins years, which are this real hinge point, but an end, I think, of that beginning. Everything that happens after that, much of it with Giuliani, are policies um, and just things that happen in the city that set the table up for Giuliani. And so the Giuliani years to me are reformation years. They're about order and control and a kind of recreation of the city that has a lot to do with going back to the past. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia in those eight years. There's a lot of recreating of New York um, that is a, a much more kind of conscious, I think. And then the third is the Bloomberg reimagining of the city after 9-11. Um, you know, Bloomberg was in, remains in many ways and had around him a lot of visionary people who really looked at the city in exciting ways, who brought new ideas to the table. Um, but many, many people were also outside of the view of that vision, sadly. So those are the kinds of 
I think those are the three cities that I based it on. And they're all, they're all New York, but they're all built on the other. You know, they all get a little bit bigger, a little bit sleeker, a little bit stronger, a little more dangerous, a little more further away from what we think of um, when we look back at the 70s at fiscal crisis New York. Um, as you just mentioned, it's, it's, it's not just about politics. It's about art, it's about architecture, it's about music, it's about popular culture. It's about the impact of high tech industry coming to New York as one of our saviors out of the fiscal crisis, actually. Uh, it's a book about global, uh, the impact of globalization and gentrification. Um, how does that all inform what you're writing about? How does politics inform that and how does that inform politics? Is that a fair question? I mean, what, what's very impressive about this book is one of the things is the scope of it and how inclusive it is. Uh, yes, it's about politics, it's about leadership, it's about the challenges of the time, but it really gives you a sense of what life was like in New York at a particular point in time. Yeah, I mean, that was very much what I was going for. I think one of the things that I found, and I continue to find uh, another frustrating thing when people talk about the city is there's this kind of ring of passivity about it. This happened to us. These things happened to us in the city, you know, and when the book begins, I think there was this always in old New York, there was a sense of survival. And now there's a kind of, well, this is all happening to us. And I think one of the things I wanted to really put on the bones of this was how much happens that is not just about policy. That's not about somebody in city hall pushing a button or signing a law or uh, someone in Wall Street or you know, a, a office building you know, making a deal. This was us. This city is created by the people who live in it. And what happens in it, we didn't have to move into those places, but people did move into those neighborhoods. Their people made choices uh, on all up and down uh, through this story. And so much that's wonderful in the story, people reclaiming public space and, and starting to look at it as opposed to just kind of free space where you could do whatever you want and turning it into a place that has shared expectations of how we behave and how we use public space is a great, it's led by policy, but it's embraced by people and people take it forward. Um, housing, uh, AIDS, a lot of these things, Larry Kramer, these are people directed things that aren't just about policy, that aren't just about, or they're a reaction to policy. They're, they're hand in hand with policy. So, the book is very much a call to action at the end of the day, I hope by showing people that it wasn't just something that was done to us over these 40 years. This city was something that we created all this time. Yes, we, whoever the we is, created whoever it. Whoever the we is, right. And there's a lot of different we's and that's why I wanted to be also incredibly inclusive as much as I and, could. And that. What created was not all good either. And I, I think that's an important point of the book. I don't want this to sound Pollyannish because I don't think Absolutely. that was, that was Absolutely your, not. Yeah. Cool. That's one of the one of the other nice things about the book is it is the sense of balance. You mentioned Larry Kramer. Um, just a, there's a quote in here from him um, hmm. that I'd like you to uh, explain. Um, and uh, he talks about the AIDS crisis, which was in the middle of Koch years. And Koch, well, I mean, Koch himself is a, is a very interesting, complicated figure in the sense that he pulled us through the fiscal crisis and balanced the books. He brought in extraordinary leadership um, that some of those people are still playing, are still involved in the game right. of politics and government these days. Uh, they're sort of the wise people of, of New York City politics. Um, people like her, you know, Carl Weisbrod, Herb Sturz, whatever, you know, back. Um, he, there was also a lot of tension around him. We see as Koch takes us through there, there's a lot of uh, tension with the black community. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of alienation with the black community and his, um, he uh, had a very formidable mouthpiece that didn't always take us where, where we would hope um, and, and, and was very much uh, was criticized, at least in the beginning, about how he handled the age crisis. There's an interesting quote in there by Larry Kramer, which, um, I, I, you're, which says, AIDS made it easier to be gay. Um, what, what did he mean by that? What, did, what were you getting out of that? I mean, it certainly didn't become easier in the sense that the, 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 
AIDS went away, it didn't become easy in the sense that gays right. uh, uh, and lesbians, and now we talk about transgender people, uh, weren't, weren't still suffering uh, at the hands of discrimination. What, what, is, what, what was he getting at there? Well, the arc of the, of the AIDS crisis, and, and I think it's hard to, you know, having lived through that, and, and not as a gay man, but having worked in entertainment, so I was friends with many and in worlds where um, I watched many people, friends of mine die, and bosses, and, and entire floors of people I worked with um, be decimated by this. And it was, I think we don't even remember, a few of us remember just how devastating that was and how it was the impact it had on the gay community of New York, um, that it, it forced certain ways of being. It, it forced being gay into the public as you couldn't hide that. You couldn't hide dying of AIDS. Um, it transformed real estate in places. It, it, it really changed the the philosophy, the, the kinds of cleansing that we saw in the Giuliani years, I think are very much built on the AIDS crisis. And so was it easier to become gay in that way in that one of the things it forced was a greater sense of, of a new definition of the gay community, I think, in that it had been certainly a great community of connection, of sexual connection, of developing a new language that was kind of based on, on sexual connectivity. But what came out of it was something that became deeper and, and maybe richer in that those who were not accepted by their family, those who were not able to be cared for were received by the rest of the community. And the community defined itself in much broader terms than in just the terms of sexuality that it had been defining itself as, or at least giving a broader definition of what sexuality was. So it became much harder. The kinds of exclusion and, and hatred that took place for gay people during that period was, it was remarkable. I mean, it was just horrifying. And what came out of it was on the other end, by the time we get to the early 90s or mid 90s, was a, a kind of different understanding and a different place for for gay men and women in, in the city. Um, one of the other things you write about is immigration and the impact of immigration. New York has always been an immigrant city, obviously. Yeah. We're all the children of immigrants or the grandchildren or whatever. Um, since 1978, uh, the immigrant population has grown by one and a half million, as you said, the size of Philadelphia. Right. What impact have immigrants have on, on the city recently? You know, well, certainly during this period, I think they have brought, you know, they stabilized the city in some very fundamental ways. When we look at the Koch Housing Initiative, you know, this is something that opens the doors for immigrants to come in. Um, it's not just sort of shifting people around, it's a welcoming in of more immigrants to help settle neighborhoods and to help rebuild neighborhoods. The business, you know, outside of, of Manhattan, outside of Midtown and Wall Street, the revitalization of neighborhoods outside, uh, you know, in the outer boroughs is very much an, an immigrant phenomena. So they've had an enormous impact on the city down to Things like um, Korean delis in the early 80s, you know, during when crime was still a really potent thing in the city, you know, you'd be out at 11 o'clock and you'd see a couple blocks away a, a deli, you know, on the streets were dark and there was another splash of light, you'd walk towards it and there you were. It was an important part of the street and Korean delis provided a very important role um, not just in that, but in providing food in, in, um, in food deserts, you know, I mean, so all of those things in their, you know, the, the kind of communities, the smaller networks that different immigrant communities created, built into bigger ones and stabilized the city and helped them grow in different ways. Um, so, you know, the amount of people that were added, and also you could say that the MTA and the subway system, the number of riders on the seven train alone, you know, that, that was an immense help to the budget of the, of the subway system by just increasing the number of people who were using it. So those kinds of uses, those kinds of different kinds of revenue that aren't just tax revenues that, that immigrants added to the city 
um, was immeasurable. So they really had a fundamental role in saving and evolving the city over these years. Uh, Korean delis also became a flashpoint for racial politics, as yep. David Dinkins found out the hard way yep. uh, during a, a period when there was a lot of animosity towards Korean grocers. Right. And tensions between claims that uh, 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 between the black community where they were situated in, in, the, um, in the in the owners themselves. Right. Well, one of the things that you know is one of the quotes or ideas that was important to me was something Richard Sennett says about how we build communities, and in a kind of paraphrase is that you know too often we want to build community on on what we have in common. And that's sort of easy, you know, we all like fireworks, we all like this kind of food, we all like the, you know, um, or we've all had this kind of experience, but really strong communities are built on addressing difference and having the conversation about difference and not trying to paper over those things, but addressing those things. And to me, that is a, a huge takeaway for the future. But, you know, when we speak to those kinds of flashpoints, um, it would have been great to talk about those differences as opposed to sort of, you know, finding commonality is good, but what we really need to do is have conversations about difference. Um, one of the things I admire about the book truly is you go to great lengths to be balanced and fair and to tell the whole story in not, um, uh, about what was going on at particular times and about particular figures in the city. I'm going to read you a quote of yours. Um, and then we'll, we'll, just, we'll talk about who. Um, uh, this particular individual I'll write about uh, was a beacon of empathy and comfort for all New Yorkers, no matter who they were, how much they made, or the color of their skin. Who are you writing about there? Right. I'm writing about Rudy Giuliani, believe it or not, right? Um, what happened? <laughs> I mean, we, for, for the year before 9-11, we could not get rid of Rudy quick enough. You know, there'd been a couple horrifying cases, Patrick Dorisman, terrible cases of police brutality, police murder. Um, it, everyone wanted him to go. That, that primary day, as people went to the schools to, you know, they were just sort of, we're done with Rudy. And then 9-11 happened, and he really stood up to it. I mean, he really, for that two months or so, three months, he was exactly that. He was a beacon of empathy. He was somebody that we looked to for strength and he delivered it. Um, and it is remarkable and, and sad and bizarre what happens after that. And, and the reality is that even as that's going on, he starts to do some plays in the background about maybe staying on for mayor for some indeterminate amount of point. I mean, there was some politicking happening over time, in, even in behind the facade, but he really was able to tap into something. And it's only, I think the sad part is because he was initially at least so strong in terms of leadership of being able to giving a sense of the city, having someone in control of it. If he had been able to bring some of that empathy, some of that sense of mercy, some of that sense of not othering people, but really embracing the city as the whole, if he had been that man the day he walked into office, um, it, it would have been remarkable. It makes what may kind of made me sad to think of what could have happened in those years if he would have brought that to the tools he had. Um, you write about the mindset of the city during Giuliani's first administration. And you talk about democratic baby boomers uh, who, as you would say, convince themselves that 60s values, 70s realism and 80s greed could lead to a more prosperous future. Um, was that, that the mindset at the time? Is that, uh, is that where the city was? Is that where we've been taken? Well, I mean, it was all kind of hand in hand with, uh, with Clinton and, and kind of the new Democrat kind of mindset of, and tech had a role to play in that, is that now with a deindustrialized economy, tech was starting to grow into something that, gee, we're going to make money. We're going to have this new big industry that we'll be able to make a lot of money on, on Wall Street and we won't have big factories creating pollution and it'll create all kinds of jobs and revenue and we'll march forward into the future. And so 
it was the sense was you could be rich and do good things too. And that, you know, we'd raise all the, all the ships would rise, but a lot of people drowned as the water rose. And I think the new Democrats and I certain, certainly in my day was thinking it was pretty great to be able to think you could make money and then just write, you know, write checks to charities and things like that. And the reality is that um, it, it let people off the hook. It let people stop looking at systematic racism. It let them stop looking at the systematic uh, economic problems that we had. And it did, it co-opted the Democrats for quite a while, you know, uh, and I think we're, possibly finally getting to a point of getting out of that, but that's sort of out of the purview of the book. But that was certainly the ethos of the city was a, a lot of people who wanted to do good, who thought they were doing good, who said they were doing good, who wrote checks to good things, but were involved deeply in economics that were not doing good, or at least were not focused on that, were focused on the money. You, you draw a very interesting distinction between you know, the old patricians, you know, old patrician wealth of, of the Rockefellers uh, and their charities and what you describe as their sense of obligation to the city right. and the new wealth in the, what I would call the new wealth. I don't know if you use that term. Right. It's, it's um, but, you know, people who have kind of made fast money more recently and you see a different attitude between the two. Sure, I mean, they're back in the day, you know, in those 70s and before when you had the Rockefellers as a leading family of New York. I mean, when you look around the map of New York of the institutions, Rockefeller Center and the cathedral, and, and they're just a part of the city, things that they built. Um, they were just part and parcel of the city and of redeveloping it at times, so just sort of being a leading family. Um, and there was, along with the vast amount of money that they were milking out of the city, a, a sense of obligation to the place itself. And, and I think not, not a false one. You know, if you were to put them on the political spectrum now, I think they would probably be very much centrist Democrats. You know, Nelson, Nelson Rockefeller had no problem coming up with ways to lend money to build things or all over the city. So there was a sense of, of just responsibility, not even kind of giving back. It was it was part of what the job of being uh, uh, that rich involved. And I think the, the grandfather had been a part of that. Um, so it's not to lionize the wealthy and say that they were somehow more enlightened, but there was a generation and many cities had, you know, you look at the Pittsburghs and the Philadelphia's, there were families that also in the post-war era participated deeply in urban renewal to help save the central business district. So in that way, the Rockefellers were kind of a supersized version of some of those families. But when we get into the 90s, when we get into the 2000s, we just have wealth and we have a much more globalized economy, which is one of the part issues of it. You know, when New York uh, and other cities are much more locally based economically, you have companies, corporations that are locally established, the people live in the city and they frankly have more skin in the game. And when you have international corporations, um, frankly, the people don't, well, they weren't as involved and wealth and Wall Street are not as intimately involved in the city. And I don't know if people identify with it to the same degree or haven't traditionally in, in, in the last 20 or 30 years. So I think it's one of the profound negatives of globalization. On the other hand, you know, immigrants are part of globalization too. So that's a word that I, I, it's one of those words that when you throw it around, I think you have to be very careful about what you mean because it has profound pluses and minuses and that detachment of the corporate class from the city is one of the major minuses of it. Well, that brings us, I think, to Bloomberg's New York, which he called, using his, his language, a luxury item. You right. know, it's this jewel that, um, this precious jewel, which, suggests to me uh, something that very few people have access to. Right. Um, and you talk about the development of networks um, that are not inclusive. Um, and, you know, it coincides with a uh, increase in disparities of wealth in the city that are historical, that, you know, 20% of the population is below the poverty line, another more than 20% is close to the poverty line. Right. While you have all this extraordinary increase in wealth 
uh, through hedge fund managers and, and, and what's going on on Wall Street and then and the real estate industry to a certain extent. Um, is that where we are now? Is that the city? It, are we still living in the luxury city? Um, are we trying to undo that um, where people are excluded? I mean, uh, you know, it also coincided with stop and frisk where uh, a population of mostly black and Latino men were put in jail. Um, it uh, creates enormous racial tension. Um, poor people and people of color were kind of left out of this you know, this reinvention was it was if it was a if it was a reinvention, it was reinvented with a lot of people left out of the story. Right, right. And, you know, one of the statistics that that left out to me was um, was one you mentioned about poverty, because that the 20 percent that you have by the end of Bloomberg is, I think, at the beginning of Koch, it was something correct me if I'm wrong, it was somewhere around 16 or 17 percent. It is. It is over those 40 years that that percentage of people in poverty remains relatively within a certain bandwidth at a certain place. What goes through the roof is wealth, you know, and it's the disparity uh, that is just what is the most yawning thing. It's not that more people are, the gross number of people in poverty as the city grows increases, and that's a sort of demographic issue, but what really kills the city is that I, you know, I'm gonna say kill, but what is most damaging is that visible wealth, that that forcing people into believing that they're not really citizens of the city anymore, you know. And in the Bloomberg sense, yes, um, that you know, I don't want to be in a position of of defending. I think there was a lot that was creative and moving towards. I think the model there was let's just get as much revenue as we can to pay for this other stuff, you know, and that is a put an enormous amount of, of power in the hands of the real estate sector to develop that and to kind of create that revenue to do the other things. And the problem is that that just created a cycle where it created more problems to spend money on, you know, and not spend money on a lot of the right things, which was taking care of infrastructure like the subways and properly funding them as much as we could, doing as much as we possibly could for NYCHA and public housing and things like that, and really dropping the ball on, on paying attention to the things that made New York what it was really great at and paying more attention on getting in tourists, looking for ways to create revenue um, that I think they truly believed were to help, but not to structurally change anything. So. Yeah, well, an increase in wealth on the part of the wealthy and a static position on part of the working class, middle class, people in poverty is the very definition of inequality. And right, exactly. Right. It wasn't just a New York phenomenon. New York was worse than uh, most places or pro practically all places, maybe right. except San Francisco. Right. Um, it was a national phenomenon. Um, and it wasn't all produced locally either, although some people would say, uh, you know, it was a lot of it was a function of federal policy, you know, I, and, and you deal with that uh, in terms of the role that the federal government played uh, in uh, in responding to pressures from, from the financial community. I guess in some ways we can't say it was produced in New York as Wall Street happens to be in New York. Right, right. I mean, that's a weird thing where New York is a part, it's a director of the global economy through Wall Street and, and banking but it also has its own local economy and kind of trying to parse the two out is, is sometimes tricky. Yeah, I mean, uh, your language, um, bankers were handed the rudders on, by Clinton, the wheel by Bush, and then you go on and talk about the, um, uh, you know, the subprime mortgage crisis where you know, Obama administration bails out the banks that were involved yeah. in predatory lending. Um, and uh, in lots of poor whites and African Americans lost their homes, lost their mortgages, uh, lost, as you said, billions of dollars in capital because that was where they stored most of their capital. If they right. Were. Or worse off, I mean, people who actually owned homes clear um, were able to take out, you know, home equity loans. So they ended up 
going into the red after actually being at a good place and having things that were appreciating and building capital, they ended up losing money by taking out loans against them that just got destroyed and all that. I mean, it was, it was the amount of money that was sucked out of the city largely in those communities is, is indefensible. You know, so yeah, that's absolutely, the fact that, that Bloomberg, his, his heart went to defending the financial community during all that uh, is definitely a, a strike against him. Um, it, it, it was sad. It, it showed his kind of distance from the people fundamentally in the way that Giuliani distanced himself from New Yorkers at the end. Bloomberg did as well. Yeah. I mean, there, there's another side to this story, which uh, I always try to look at things in a positive way. Maybe it doesn't sound like that from my question today, but um, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff in the book too, you know. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, you know, the role the federal government plays is very important, and um, right, and um, what we're seeing now may be a sign of hope as the city. Right. I mean, cities around the country, what we're going to be doing going forward. It, it, it's, it has everything to do with what the federal government is going to be doing and helping to pay for this stuff. So, I mean, it's what, how much we're able to change inequality in the city is going to be a matter of public policy, but it's also the demand for that policy to change. And I'm very excited by the fact that we have so much turnover in the city council, that we have so much turnover in city hall, and that there is honestly so much enthusiasm and interest about it. Um, it. It is a real opportunity for for changing things in the city. I think there is a taste for it. the The sad truth is that you know terrible moments like this, like 9/11, like the fiscal crisis, these are opportunities for serious change, and we have one in front of us. So, but it will take more than just waiting for the real estate community to do that or waiting for the city hall to do it. We have to, in various ways, try to pressure that to happen, make our voices heard in those ways and change it in, in I think, ways that are gonna be more generative and, and that will hopefully change that inequality. Um, let's uh, let's uh, talk a little bit more about race. Um, we saw Black Lives Matter demonstrations throughout the city and the country over the summer. Uh, we recently acknowledge an increase in violence against Asians. Where do you think the city is on the racial issue? Where are we going? Where do we have to go? Well, I, I, you know, again, my hope goes to the younger people in the city and new generations that I think are expecting to live in a more diverse world. Um, you know, I was the tail end of the baby boom generation, last couple of years of it. So um, what we considered justice is, or movement along those ways in the wake of the civil rights movement looks now to be pretty weak tea, even if at the time it seemed like it was great advancement. And um, what, again, I think younger people, I have two kids in their 20s, and they expect a city that's integrated. They expect diversity. They, they, that's what they want. And I think the future of the city is in creating more of that possibility and not just in ways that involve gentrification. It's not just moving more white kids into black neighborhoods. It's we have to come up with ways to create that more. But is there tension? Yes. And I go back to that Senate point about talking about that conflict, not trying to talk happy to things about it. The fact that we've had difficult, difficult moments in the last year is actually to me a very good sign because it means that we're finally, maybe, hopefully, having the very difficult conversations that lead to change instead of papering it over. So that's my hope that these difficult moments are really what are the reasons for hope and not just walking by. Yeah. Let, let me conclude with a, a question that has, has uh, kind of informed my work for the last I don't know how many years. And you know, studying New York over a period so long, I've almost gotten to treat it as a character of a story. And I've you've seen it go through tough times and better times. And you know, I, I have these, I throw these questions at my students because they have no no they, they have no 
a choice but to listen to me. But, um, uh, and, you know, I say, well, what do we make of this character called New York? It is, is it a, does it have a soul? Is it a, um, if it does, it has a kind and caring soul or, it, or is it a, uh, that's capable of taking care of its most vulnerable people? Or is it just a hard-nosed, mean, competitive guy who, you know, some will make it and some won't? Right. Uh, what do we make of this character called New York? After studying it for, I, you say, eight years, you, you've been studying it for much longer than eight years. It, right. Eight, eight years. But right. how do you come away from this? Do you, do, you, do, you, are you, do you like this place called New York? Do you feel good about it? Listen, after, how could you walk around today and not love it? I mean, what a day this was. I mean, it was kind of back to, um, it felt like spring again. And I mean that with a capital S, you know, it was just a beautiful day. The streets were full of people and that's what we need are those streets full of people. So, you know, the book I always think of when I, that's kind of a, a beacon for me is Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, which is, just a small book, but anybody who cares about cities should have read it. And it's, it's uh, Marco Polo is sitting with Kublai Khan in Xanadu and he describes each of these amazing cities that he's been to. And, you know, one is made completely of pipes that connect the houses and one is made completely of old postcards and another is made of the trash that flies behind it. And at a certain point, Kublai Khan looks at him and says, wait, aren't these all Venice? And, Kubla, and, and Marco Polo kind of goes, yeah, but he keeps going on. And you realize that he keeps telling more of these cities. And you realize he's really talking about all cities. All of these cities have, they're all different cities of every city, you know? And so to me, this idea that New York lost its soul over these years, and these, during, these are the years that hip hop is invented. And people from around the planet come. We again that 1.5 million people move to New York and create completely new ways of living, new music, new culture. You know, New York culture blasts apart into all kinds of fabulous things that are very difficult to put back together again, but are so fabulous. To say that we lost our soul during those years is is very blinkered, I think. So to say that there's a soul for me is is just not how I look at the city. I look at this city made up of, of eight and a half million of us, you know, each coming up with that and that tale of two cities as well. It's a, it's a thin um, metaphor because we never get to that point of them both being true in some fundamental way. And that's what I wanted to burrow through is how, what is it? Where is that place where all these things are true at once? And so, yeah, I, I, it's a wonderful place and it's a terrible place. I think your book captures both sides. I must say, and by the way, I start off my course with Italo Calvino as my student for a test. Oh, really? That's, um, so we're on the same it's page. Such a, it, it's and such a um, at book. the end of the day, I, I, I agree with you. I tell my students, you know, and I've been asked, you know, why do you think New York is such a, why does it have a, a, a decent caring soul? And, I, and I, part of the reason is I, I can't, I have to believe it. And one of the reasons I believe it is and, and say it is because of what you mentioned before, you don't want to discourage young people who are going to make it a better place and you need to be able to show both sides and i think your book does that very well right thank you um i think we're right we're we're exactly 45 minutes mac you're going to be so pleased that we question away uh, even a minute off i don't know how we managed to do that um but the floor is yours thank you joe this has been great thank you tom um there, it's a sprawling book, so we have a sprawl of questions. Um, and, you know, they hop around a bit from topic to topic. I'll give you a few of them. To begin, um, a question from Mason Williams. First, he says, this is a great conversation about an excellent book. I'm curious about another one of the big developments of this period. Why do you think the city became so much more expensive? In 1970, the median New Yorker paid 20% of their income on rent. Now it's 34%. How, why did this happen? Joe Kay puts the question more succinctly, have rents in New York always been ridiculous? Yes. I mean, you know, they, but there were moments when the whole market reset fundamentally. I mean, it was always a challenge. The, the fantasy that there were, 
there were cheap places to live in the 70s. I mean, Soho and, and Lower East Side places downtown, yes, you could find cheap places. But at the end of the day, um, it was never cheap or easy to find an apartment in, in New York. But at a certain moment, certainly under Giuliani, the entire real estate market, I, I, I think I, the word to say is reset. You know, we lost a lot of apartments in the 70s and 80s to conversions, which is a whole other topic where a certain portion of the um, rentals suddenly went co-op. The big families that owned buildings decided to kind of cash out and it created a very difficult period of people having to decide whether they could afford to live in the city anymore, whether they could invest in an apartment. So that was one reset. And then under Giuliani, you had years where buying an apartment, you could double your money in a couple of years. You know, it, it just went that high. Apartments on the Upper West Side that would have cost $300,000 were suddenly $600,000. And then by the by 2000, they were a million dollars. And that happened really, really fast. So. It was not always as bad. There was a kind of moment, I think, in the mid to late 90s that shot it through the sky and out of reach of people. There's a question from a candidate for New York City Comptroller, Chris McNichol. Uh, I'll, I, I better read this verbatim. <laughs> With respect to inequality in New York City, is it true to say the unusual period was between 1945 and 1970 or so when it declined? And in most other periods, New York was just about the most unequal place in the United States. Weren't the decades prior to 1929 similar to the decades leading up to 2013 with respect to inequality? I will preface that by saying that my, you know, certainly my knowledge of the last 40 years definitely outstrips my knowledge of, you know, the, the, uh, the 20s and, and all that. But I, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yes. I mean, I think when we talk about the workers' paradise and the city that was created um, you know, during the LaGuardia period with FDR, with Al Smith, the city in, 19, in 1898 is, it's the, that's when the city begins fundamentally. That's when the five boroughs consolidate. And a lot of what we think of as, as public works were things that the subway systems, things like that, helped stitch the boroughs together. You know, and that's very much consciously part of what LaGuardia did with that. And free college and a lot of the services that the city provided um, went a long way. So I, I think there's truth to that, that probably there was the, the exception was that period where you also had a great industrial economy that was able to take care of those people and also the peers. You know, that is the, the loss of the peers and shipping in New York is the most devastating thing that happens because unskilled labor has nowhere to go at that point. So I, I sounds right. Michael Sharrow asks uh, if you'll talk about the good and the bad that has come from gentrification overall. Well, tuck in everyone, do you have a couple hours? I mean, it's a very, um, it's very easy to see the, the bad, um, but it's also very easy to see the good and there, there um, change happens, you know? I mean, and we, we need to be able to talk about neighborhoods undergoing change um, in some natural way, but there is an unnatural way where big money interests come in and force change on neighborhoods when people move in and kind of live on top of neighborhoods as opposed to finding their ways into the neighborhood. So the good is for those who are able to remain who are being you know, gentrified, um, there is a often a rise in services, a rise in quality of, of, of public services, a rise of what they're able to buy around them, um, which is doubly frustrating because it, it sort of, it could have been there before, but now it's only there because the gentrifiers, largely white, have now come into the neighborhood. And that is um, devastating. So we see a lot of public housing that now is surrounded with gentrified, you know, side housing. Um, so it provides some benefits, but on a cultural and kind of community level, it's devastating. The good part is, the city keeps building and growing and changing, and it would be terrific if we can start to make that process happen with a little more um, contact between those who are coming in and those who are there originally. I mean, we need to find organized ways to bring those people together operationally. Bill Luckashock, a friend of Hunter's, uh, asks, how do you assess the schism between the city's political class, i.e. the progressive wing, 
and the city's business leaders? Um, well, I mean, that, I think we're seeing that political class becoming more progressive as it, to some degree reflecting what New Yorkers are wanting right now. Um, I, I think at other points along the way in these 40 years, the, the degree of communication between the business class and the corporate, corporate New York and business New York and the city politicians varies. It changes from time to time, you know, where people are at any time. That should be a better level of communication. And I think um, it's up to each administration to sort of set the tone for that. But, uh, you know, it, there is a tension there that should be good. You know, when we put in regulations, when you have progressive policies, as long as they admit that we need to have business, we understand that business and making money is part of what New York does, but let's talk about not making that the only job of the city and the only purpose of the city. And I think asking, um, having a political class that asks questions of the business community is a good thing. We need that intermediary role of the city as opposed to just being uh, a body that's there to kind of help the business class. So. I think it's a good tension if it's managed right. Jared Goldstein asks, how did racial populations shift over those 40 years in terms of numbers and percentages? That is probably something I don't have right in front of me. I mean, it's a sort of tough like policy yeah. uh, kind of demographic yeah. issue. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting, one of the points that I, I get to a lot in the book to is the demographics of Harlem. And, and how so many people leave Harlem that it, it is kind of ripe for growth and the shift in, in power that happens between Harlem and, and Brooklyn. They've sort of always been competitive and um, Harlem finds itself in a new place as it loses more people basically. And so when we look at the redevelopment and gentrification of Harlem, um, that is very much an outgrowth of, of Black Harlem trying to reinvent itself. So it's hard to throw out numbers. I just don't have them right at hand to, to be able to put out there. But I mean, the other part to throw in there, sorry, is, is of course immigration. And, um, you know, talking about West Indian population as well as the African American population, um, mm -hmm. lumping those all together, I think can be a demographic mistake because what they wanted was not necessarily always the same. Um, a follow-up statement from Bill Lukashak uh, for you to respond to. He says that business seems to be left out of the discussion of how we get out of fiscal problems. Well, I mean, if certainly if you go back to, if you want to go all the way back to the fiscal crisis, I think the exact opposite happened. I mean, we, the city was essentially handed over to the business community. They were, um, you know, Mac and, and stuff were really about putting it in the, the business community's hands. So, um, I don't know if that is exactly accurate at that point. I mean, to say that that's always been the fact, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I, I think it's a bigger problem that the business community um, has sometimes detaches itself from the city, as I said before. I mean, I think it would be great um, the more skin in the game that we have from the business community, the better. But that means thinking about things other than just quarterly reports. Uh, Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer asks, in this municipal election year, what can we learn from your book about charting a course forward that closes the inequality gap and helps the city survive and thrive? A focus on education, sensible policing, better transportation, or what? Uh, all of the above. Um, but I would also say, again, that I think housing has really led the way. Um, when we look at the other kind of cycles of the city going from um, Koch kind of inviting in that second generation of urban pioneers to the housing initiative that really lays the groundwork for the drop in crime. I don't think that was just a policing thing. I think that was also about housing. It was about neighborhoods restabilizing, about empty lots turning into housing, had a major impact on what happened under Giuliani. Um, so I, I think housing if you're looking for transformation in the city, I think that is the basic building block, but obviously all those pieces are 
ways out of inequality, but housing, if you're gonna talk about education, if you're gonna talk about integration, diversity, it has to start with where people live and how they do it. That's great. Um, there's a question about education appropriate for an event hosted by Hunter College. Steve Ako asks, in your estimation, has decentralization and merrill control been a boon or a bust for education? No. <laughs> if you want to pass, that's okay. I mean, that's, I mean sorry, I don't want to pass. You know, yeah. I, I, right. you know, education is is a, you know, and I did that book with 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 Rudy Crew, and the thing I learned from Rudy, which was very important, was it was right after um, No Child Left Behind was passed during the Bush years. And he said, okay, great. If we're going to do something about schools, let's, you know, and everybody's pointing fingers as they still do and will always do. Is it unions? Is it, you know, who is it? Who is at fault here? And he said, let's try to break down what every person has to do. What does everybody, what does the president have to do? What does the mayor have to do? What do city council people have to do? What do teachers and principal, like let's all find what, who, you know, what is everyone's accountability here? And so it, it kind of taught me a, a way of looking 360 at every problem. Everybody's got some skin in the game. Everybody has some level of responsibility, even if it's just showing up once in a while to a meeting, everybody has some skin in the game. And so um, that's an aside, I guess, but I mean, education is, is a whole world in itself. And I guess my sorry thought is why I didn't go deeper into it here is that you know the numbers were not doing a much better job than we ever were before and, and I wish they were and should be a greater mover than they are and I think it's one of the hopes we should be having is looking for a school system that does it and it's not for lack of effort and lack of money I've, I've met can't tell you how many teachers and people I know in this you know in the school system who are devoted to it, brilliant, caring people and administrators who will give everything and the checks get written, um, it is hard to solve that one. And I thought in a book that already had 1300 pages that I needed to cut in half, education was gonna be hard to do the kind of justice that it deserves in the context of that. So that there was a kind of practicality to that as well. Yes. Um, if it's all right, we'll just do a couple I'm, more. I'm, I'm here. Great. Um, over the four decades that you looked at, asks Jim Stenke, what factors have influenced the relationship between mayors and governors? And Joe, please feel free to uh, jump in on this one if you like. Yeah, please. I mean, and listen, Joe, at any point, unless you, if you'd like to get between me and the bullets, that would be fine. Um, <laughs> the, you know, it, there have been a lot of, a number of very interesting mayoral and governor relationships. I mean, Koch and Kerry leaps out as the first one um, where Kerry, you know, Koch was not Kerry's guy, Cuomo was Kerry's guy, but they end up with at least Kerry feeling enough of a sense of, of largesse and responsibility that he works with Koch on kind of stabilizing things. Um, who do we have then? I think the other ones that leap out. I mean, the relationship between Giuliani and Pataki is, is scary. You know, I mean, I think that they both um, cut the city down remarkably and, and work together on that and had their own power plays within it. Um, I mean, it's, it's always, it, 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 in a way, it's a book in itself of, of that relationship. You know, the, the complexities of home rule and there are so many fine points of it. One of the things I was interesting to me to really think about in doing the book was how much of the city isn't in the city's hands, whether we're talking about the subway system, but even all of the, the kind of port authority things, a lot of state controlled pieces of the city that aren't New York City. You know, Battery Park City is New York State. I mean, it's New York City, but it's also, it's owned by that. So um, it, it's a very complicated, I can't really go through each because that will take about an hour. Um, but they all, it's an important, crucial relationship. I, if I may say, I, I think that the institutional relationship itself sets up uh, opportunities for tension. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can go through all of them and we won't. Um, you know, for example, Lindsay and Rockefeller did not get along. 
what was interesting about that, they, they agreed on most policy issues. And they were two what was called then liberal Republicans, which wasn't an oxymoron in those days. Right. Um, and now, you know, the, the rumor is that um, that the Blasio and, and Andrew Cuomo don't get along very well. I mean, I don't know how true that is. That's uh, a rumor, of course. Um, but seriously, um, a lot of the, what's going on there is is really personal. Because it, it personal for sure, but but what's interesting about what the press does with it is they, they focus on the personal and they don't really come to terms with the fact that they politically are worlds apart in terms of where, the, where their vision for the state and the city is. Um, and that's unfortunate because we miss out on a lot of important policy conversations by treating, by just focusing on the personality things which which are interesting and entertaining but are not very substantive right right well the final question no less more difficult than most of these that have been asked <laughs> to this point um and we can end with this one uh, what do you think the 2020s will be known for as a decade if you were to predict uh it's going to be you know i think well, that could go a lot of ways, you know, and, and predicting things is, is kind of, uh, you know, I'm not a gambling guy. Certainly, the reaction to the pandemic is going to define the reaction to the pandemic and whether in four years, um, you know, we have some kind of crazy backlash in a general election sense, because I still worry about that. Um, but I think how we react to the pandemic is going to define the decade. Um, this is kind of setting the tone. This lets us know what our choices are and what we can try to have and what we want to have. And what those choices are are going to be what defines the decade. So will it be some great rediscovery of community and, and equality and equity? That would be good. Um, but it's also possible that it could be an amazing period of, of sellout and, and political turmoil. I mean, that's also extremely possible. So we're on a knife's edge, folks, to end on a happy note, but. Yeah. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you for answering all these questions. Um, I appreciate it, the audience appreciates it. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, before we wrap up, any final question, uh, any final points you'd like to make, any final thoughts? I, I'm, I am, you know, I'm thrilled. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Professor Vita Reedy and, and Professor Holzer. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. With that, we can say goodnight. Take care. Good night.